have an opportunity today to preach on the gift of forgiveness. Uh, something that I am uh, firsthand this week. And I'm not going to share about what happened or anything, but understanding that I learned uh, even more about um, about um, about forgiveness. And forgiveness is something that is so desperately needed in the body of Christ. And, you know, one of the things that I think that we, we mature in our pathway as we mature in Christ, that many times what happens is we actually become so numb that we forget what forgiveness is. We become so numb that we forget that God, as we get into the scriptures today, that you'll see that life is in forgiveness. Life is in forgiveness. Restoration is in forgiveness. Freedom is in forgiveness. And peace is in forgiveness. If you turn over to the book of Luke, and in chapter 23, a story that you're very, very familiar with, and the Lord kind of showed me something as I was reading this this past week, trying to find forgiveness in the situation that I was in. And if we read in chapter uh, 23, I'm going to start again in, th in 32 and go all the way to 43. In 32, and it says, And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put, on, put, put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I want to stop there because so many times in the many messages that maybe you've heard or even I've shared or I've even heard, is that so many times we look at that and that Jesus was on the cross and he was saying to the whole world, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I want to just kind of look at another possibility here because forgiveness brings healing. Forgiveness brings restoration. Forgiveness brings life. There were two men on the cross. There were people at his feet. There were people all around, and two things happened on the cross. That, well, three things. He was, we were restored back to Jesus. We were restored back to the Father. But two other things happened. And let's continue to read down here. And it says, And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding. And the rulers also said to them, Deride him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, Save thyself. And a subscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other... rebuked him. And saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you this day, shall be with me in paradise. Life is in forgiveness. Restoration is in forgiveness. Freedom 
is in forgiveness. Peace is in forgiveness. I looked at this and I read it over and over and over. And Jesus, not only on the cross, was taking the sin from all of us, from the beginning of time until the end of time, upon himself. But he did not say anything that this man looked over and saw a place of repentance. He saw the thing because it wasn't that anything Jesus said. He looked at him and he saw that he was an innocent man. He saw that he was not worthy to be hung on the cross. And something touched his heart. Something touched his heart as he looked over. And he realized at that particular point in time that he needed to understand forgiveness. When all of a sudden Jesus said that one thing, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The greatest gift that we can do with someone else, and I've heard it said over and over and over if they would have only known it, they would have never done it. Or one thing or another, or somebody doesn't match up to our standard of life, we don't realize how much of unforgiveness that is. Jesus was on the cross paying a penalty for each and every one of us, and there's no one on this earth today that can be exempted from that unforgiveness. In Colossians chapter 2.13, it says this, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he that quicketh together with him hath forgiven you all trespasses. He has forgiven us all our trespasses. But how did we get here in the walk that we are right now. I want to bring back some scriptures, and I hope that it kind of gives you a thought process about forgiveness and unforgiveness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, this is what it says. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. This is how we started, folks. That day when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God forgave you. He forgave you on the cross. He forgave you for the things that you were, even though you were in your trespasses, he still forgave us. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and here is the key, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. The greatest ministry that Jesus had was not going to the cross. That was a will of God for him to be there so that we would be able to be we would be reconciled back to him. The greatest ministry that Jesus had was the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation is this, that I don't care how bad you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how much of a sinner you are. I don't care. It doesn't matter. I still love you. While we were yet dead in our sins, he forgave us. As an illustration, as an understanding, as a, a, to come to the realization of what he has done for us and how much more should we be in that same spirit of forgiveness to someone else. Now, I know we're all going to sit here, and I'm going to tell you, we're going to get into a little bit more, but I know that there are times that you didn't do anything wrong, nothing. 
but you may have to be the one to forgive. See, Jesus was on the cross, and he didn't do anything, and he forgave us. We, as the body of Christ, have to continue to walk in that place of grace and peace. He found us. He found us. He's not lost. We were lost. And he found us, and we became brand new, born again, righteous being by forgiveness. That's how we got here. That's how you accepted Jesus Christ. You accepted him not because you wanted to go to heaven. Come on now. Because the bottom line of being is that is just an award. That's just the icing on the cake. The bottom line of being is he forgave you. He forgave you for everything that we have done from the time I was born on August 17, 1956 till today, that he has blotted my sin out. Even though I continue to do things over and over and over, the Bible says that if I sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That was done on the cross. That's what forgiveness is. And we harbor, we harbor unforgiveness, and we mask it and call it something else. Oh, well, they're just not walking up to that standard. Shut up and forgive. There's such a hardness of the body of Christ at times that we, we think that we're all, all that, and we realize that sometimes it's, we have to come to that place where it's slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to to wrath. You see, God's desire from the get-go was for us to be in that place of forgiving and forgiving and have the forgiveness of him. In Isaiah 43, 25, it says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake and will not remember thine iniquities. What a God we serve. What a God we serve. Can you imagine? Come on, let's be real. If God had to remember everything we did, and that was the, that was the, the end result, guess what? Every one of us in this room, we would be in hell. <laughs> but because of his forgiveness, because of his love and his passion towards us. But here's the thing. We need God's supernatural help to do this. It's not something that you can do in your own nature. Your nature cannot forgive. Your nature cannot forgive anybody from anything they do. The only way that you can forgive is God has to intervene into our lives so that we would be able to forgive. We need that supernatural. Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter how much power you have. It doesn't matter how much anointing you have. It doesn't matter how much of the Spirit of God you have. It's still a choice. It's still a choice to exercise the ability of unforgiveness and forgiveness. I don't care if you've got a theological name, if you're the doctor, reverend, righteous, whoever, whatever. I don't care what your title is. I don't care if you're a deacon, a bishop, an elder. A, a, I don't care who you are. That is irrelevant in the understanding of forgiveness. You see, we can, you know, many times people can walk around with that piety of, hey, do you know who I am? That I don't have to forgive anybody because I'm walking in forgiveness. <laughs> Come on now. And we have to realize that it's, it is, we have the ability to be able to forgive only through Christ Jesus. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, it says this, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. You see, it's a choice. You have to choose life or death. You have to choose blessings or cursings. 
That's a choice that God has given to you. He has given us something called free will. And that free will is to be able to be exercised what it means to forgive. The Bible, I, I, I believe that the world right now, and I know if, you were, if we were to bring a newspaper up and look at all of the stuff that's going on around the world, and yet I see over and over and over people in the body of Christ giving their opinion on what every issue that is. What my answer is? Shut up and pray. Because the bottom line is, being is, listen, listen to me, we are ambassadors for Christ. You know what that means? That means as an ambassador for Christ, you don't have an opinion anymore. The only opinion is what the Word of God says. You don't have an opinion, well, I think they should do, no. Shut up. You don't have an opinion. If you are a blood-bought child of God, the only opinion you have is what the Word of God says. And how many times we use the Word of God against others so that we can get our way. That's, we're walking in unforgiveness, folks. Unforgiveness. We're walking in that place. Let's look at Joshua. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn over to Joshua real quick. Hallelujah. Joshua 24. And we're going to start in verse 13. Joshua 24 and 13. And the word says, And I have given you a land for which ye did not labor, and cities which you did not build, and you dwell on them, of the vineyards and the olive yards which ye planted, not do you eat. Now, therefore, fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods from your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and ye serve ye the Lord. And if you seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers served that there were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, I'm going to stop there real quick because I know I hear a lot of amens. Amen. As for me and my house, we serve the Lord. Yet. Yet, 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 we're coming up next week to a, 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 a Wednesday night of a Halloween, and yet I see so many Christians walking around with horror things on, posting this and posting this. Whose Lord are you serving? As for me and my house, I will serve Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's not a double standard, folks. There's not a double standard. You're either on the Lord's side or you're not on the Lord's side. We need to be in that place where we realize and understand that, guess what? Every time we walk in that, we literally clog our pipes up. And I'm going to get into that. We clog our pipes up and we wonder why God's not blessing. It's because of unforgiveness. It's because of walking in a double standard of Christianity. God doesn't make you forgive. And he won't make you forgive. It's your choice. It's your choice. He's standing waiting right there next to us. Maybe we say something. Maybe we act out and do something. God, remember, he's omnipresent. So no matter where you are, no matter what's going on, he's standing right next to you. And all he's doing is waiting for us to acknowledge him to worship him, and to be a good ambassador for him. It's a choice, just like repentance. Repentance is a choice. God doesn't push it on you. He has given you his word. He's given you his spirit. He has given you the power to be able to not only walk in repentance, but walk in forgiveness. Example. Let's just say that this this. 
God on one side, us on the other side. Unless I had a large tube. <laughs> this went all the way up to God. Amen? And God wants to bless you. And I'm just using money because it's the only thing to please. It's not all about money. <laughs> Amen? So what happens is God says, you know what? You know, he's been faithful. She's been doing what, you know, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, you know, boom. There's a blessing. God is blessing. But we're not receiving it. Why aren't we receiving it? Unforgiveness is blocking the path. Unforgiveness is blocking the path. You see, like I said, you can be, you can be all that. You can be a, a title and you can have everything you want. But here's the bottom line. So many times we forget. We only look at unforgiveness as if I've said something to somebody. And how many times we walk away and go, but I didn't do anything. There's no way I'm going to go back and, and ask them to forgive me because it was their fault. They were the one that said that to me. Why did they say that to me? And the Spirit of God is speaking to you right then and there at that very point. And I, you mean I got to go over and forgive them for something that I didn't do? Yes. Didn't Jesus go to the cross for something that he didn't do? You see, we have to be Christians that are willing to be able to step out. Unforgiveness is like this. It's like drinking poison, expecting somebody else to die. I'm going to drink the poison because you're going to die. It ain't going to work that way. It doesn't work that way. We have to realize and understand that unforgiveness is all across the board. If Jesus forgave us and he stood there on the cross and stood, hung on the cross and said father forgive them you see that was the door that opened that guy on the other side to understand that he needed forgiveness even though jesus did nothing he realized because of the humility that jesus said father forgive them for they know not what they do I remember as, as the scripture goes on a little bit further that one of the Roman soldiers down at the bottom when all the sky started to break that he actually said, truly this man was the son of God. It was a testimony because he gave forgiveness when he didn't have to do it, but he did it. Let me put it this way. God lives in a special land and it's called <laughs> Forgiveness land. <laughs> it's not scriptural. <laughs> but he lives in forgiveness land because he understands what forgiveness is. He understands. He realizes. So let's just say there's a land called forgiveness land. That's where God dwells. Amen? <laughs> in Ephesians 4.32 says this, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So are we going to choose to live in forgiveness land? Or are we going to choose to li live in the land of grudge-holding land? Because in the land of grudge-holding land, I feel good about myself. But God doesn't live there. God lives in, unfor God lives in forgiveness land. See, the thing to understand is we've got to realize that we've got to get out of ourselves. Let me, let me, let me say this in, John, in 1 John 1, 5. Then this is the message which we have heard and declare unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. At all. So that's why he can live in Forgiveness land. Why? Because. Because. He has no darkness at all. Now, here's something I want you to look at. In James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. 
and cometh down from the Father of lights, who with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, which means his character is does not change at all. His character does not change. God cannot get sideswiped. He knows his character cannot be changed. So every excuse me, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of life. Maybe one of the things we have to start doing is also not only forgiving others, but we have to forgive God. How many times when it's not good and it's not perfect and it comes that we blame God for doing what really he didn't do. And we give the enemy so much credit. We blame the enemy because, well, of this person had passed or this has happened or all of a sudden there's a fire here or this was happening or that one. See, the bottom line is the being is there was something called sin. Sin is throughout this entire world. Sin is the is really what it ends up being is is the absence of God's intervention. What it ends up being is all the things that you see out there, guess what? We want to blame God for, for the hurricanes. We want to blame God for this. We want to blame God. And we say, oh, well, you know what? It's prophetic. It's going. Stop giving the enemy credit. Stop giving the enemy credit. You see, it's easy to do that. It's very easy. But we have to come and realize and understand that God Every good and every perfect thing comes from the Father which is in heaven. The enemy wants you to believe. The enemy wants you to believe that all the bad stuff is God's fault. That's what he wants. Because, see, if you start blaming God, he's won. What he's done is he then gets us to be separated from God because we stop loving him because look what God did. And Satan won. Satan won. Satan won that battle. He knows that if you're mad at God, it will be separated. In John 10, 10, it says this, The thief, Satan, cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I, Jesus, came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. That's what Jesus did. Jesus came so that we would have life and life abundantly. The enemy comes to kill, destroy, to rob, and to steal. I know sometimes we hear the word, and as I woke up this morning, the Lord just brought, brought a picture into my mind this morning when I woke up. And first thing that came to my mind was forgiveness and unforgiveness as soon as I woke up. So all of a sudden, God was giving me an illustration. And we hear the word this. We hear this. We harbor unforgiveness. You ever consider what the word harbor is? A harbor is a place where the water really doesn't move. It's stagnant. It's in a place where you sit there. How many times have you been into a harbor where there's a, a marina, and sometimes that what happens is if a boat sinks, that boat may stay there in the water forever. We harbor unforgiveness. That means it stays there. It's a choice that we have to be able to get what? Go find some equipment, get that boat up out of there so that it's not there anymore. Harboring means that we settle in and love being there in that place. We harbor unforgiveness. And when we harbor unforgiveness, we're dealing with hurts in our fleshly way. That's not a way to be healed. The way to be healed is as we see and as we continue. In Romans chapter 8, verse 13, it says, For if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if we, through the Spirit, do mortify, that word mortify means to assassinate, to mutilate, completely destroy the deeds of the body, we shall live. Let me read that again. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. 
but if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Flesh wants justification and judgment. Let's settle it. Let's settle it fleshly. Let's fight. Let's argue. Let's do some things that, you know what, that is not godly because we're living in that other place. We're not living in forgiveness land. We're living in grudge holding land. <laughs> but the Spirit calls for mercy and forgiveness. The enemy comes to kill, destroy, to steal, to clog, to clog up our blessing. To clog up our blessing. You see, that, that illustration here of unforgiveness is nothing more, nothing more but the enemy's tactic to stop God's blessing to our lives. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. And I'm sure that even as I have been sharing today, I believe that even in your seats this morning, that I believe that the Spirit of God has already spoke to your hearts something that you need to forgive, something that you need to go back. Maybe it's family members. Maybe it's your bosses. Maybe it's your workplace. Maybe it's maybe wherever it may be. There are things that you said. And if you're sitting there, let me tell you something. If you're sitting there right now and you're going, well, I don't have any forgiveness that I have, any unforgiveness, you better search your heart even deeper because you blocked it out so much that that unforgiveness has become so callous it's been harbored and it's sunk into the water and it's, it's staying there. We sometimes got to go back and guess what? We got to dig up that stuff and get rid of that muck and mire and get rid of it. It will stop the blessing. Sometimes we're in a life and say, why am I going around in a circle over and over and over? Why does it seem that, God, you're not hearing me? That's why that song this morning, I mean, we were singing that song. I, when, I, when, we, when I picked it the other, the other day, and I, I was bawling like a baby back there listening to this song. My God, you know, I cry out to you. How many times do we cry out to God and it seems like God's not answering? God, why aren't you answering? Maybe, 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 and I'm just saying that's between you and God. Maybe there's unforgiveness that's blocking what God wants to bestow upon you. His desire, he went all the way to the cross not to get a clog. He went all the way to the cross so that there would be an open, open communication between him and us. So Ephesians chapter 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I want you to look at the person to the right of you and the left of you. If you have aught with anybody that's sitting there, let me tell you right now, it's all flesh. And what you've done is you have literally, see, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's what it says. But against what? Principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So what do we fight? We don't fight against one another. What does the enemy want to do? The enemy wants you to have an opinion on what the world is saying so that you can walk in separation. You can walk in that grudge land. Instead of walking in forgiveness. And as I conclude in verse in ch chapter or, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. And it says, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. This is Paul talking. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the name and in the person of Christ. He says, I've done it. If I have offended, if I have caused a problem, if I have caused anything, I have forgave it in the name of Jesus Christ. I have forgiven it, not just saying, hey, I forgive you, and we walk away, we remember, and the next time you see that person, you still have that problem. You see, it was not resolved. Because you didn't give it to Christ. You held on to it because you want to hold on to it. Because you want to harbor unforgiveness. 
The longer I hold it, the more I can have a grudge against you. And I feel good because I don't have to be around you because I've got a grudge. That's not how you get healed. That's how you go into bondage. And then the final thing of that scripture, it says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. From Genesis to Revelations is about the awesomeness of God. From Genesis to Revelations is about the power of God. It's about the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God. From Genesis to Revelations is about, it's a love letter to us, warning us, helping us to understand. But also, from Genesis to Revelations is every tactic that the enemy does. You see, when you don't read the word, you don't know how the, how the enemy operates. This is not only basic instructions before leaving earth, but it's also, it's also a good battle plan against the enemy. And if you don't know the battle, see, the, ba God, the enemy's battle plan is already here. He can't create anything. He can't do anything that he's already done. So if you want to know how he operates, read the word of God. Don't open the Bible and say, oh, I'm going to see what Satan's got here for me. No, 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 I'm not saying that. But the more you read it, guess what? The more you're going to understand that the battle that's coming against you is not God. Don't blame God. God is for you. He's not against you. The enemy came to kill, destroy, rob, and steal. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. So we have the opportunity to understand the devices that Satan uses. One is unforgiveness. Because our pride feels good. Because I don't have to forgive that person. I'm going to wait until they come to me. That's nothing but alive from the pit of hell. And if you buy into that, you're going to be caught in bondage and you're going to be in the harbor of unforgiveness for a long time. So let's stand to our feet. Blessed Lord, First and foremost, we thank you for going all the way to the cross and freeing us. And that day when you were on the cross, you really, as you were speaking to those that were there, but also speaking prophetically down the road. Lord, forgive us for the things that we do not know what we do. And yet, if we are a believer, if we've accepted Christ Jesus, the, the power and the, and the Spirit of God dwells within us. Who wants to cleanse us, lead us, guide us down this walk? Holy Spirit, I ask you today, Lord, that you would turn up the volume and turn down the noise. Help us choose forgiveness. Help us to choose righteousness and peace. Help us to choose love, grace, mercy. Because, Lord God, you've given it to us all. You say to us, man, you can walk in peace and joy. You can walk. You can be an overcomer. You can be the head and not the tail. But get rid of that garbage. Get rid of that stuff that blocks how much I want to bless you. I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. I want to have an intimate conversation with you. I want to do. See, unforgiveness blocks that.
and we get angry. We get frustrated. We get disappointed. And then we start to blame God. Father, forgive us. Father, of the times, Lord God, where we blamed you for things that, Lord, it wasn't you. And Father, we humbly come before you and we repent, Lord. And Father, I pray that, Lord, for everyone in this room, that you would give us a time of meditation to where, Lord, we would be able to stop and think and allow the Holy Spirit to bring back those things. It's so easy to say, oh, it's all covered under the blood of Christ. But there's no forgiveness. Yes, the blood of Christ cleanses and heals and delivers us. But God wants us to repent. Repent on every issue. That's why we should hold short accounts of it. Christianity isn't a blanket. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord the soul to keep. Lord, forgive me of all the sins I've done today. Good night. I don't cut it. Father, we want to walk with you and talk with you and communicate with you. So, Father, stir up this morning, Lord God, all that you want us to do and be. And Father, I thank you for it, Lord. In the precious name of Jesus.